All right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the equations of motion rel uh, relevant to, or relevant for, I guess, electric vehicles. Uh, the main thing is going to be Newton's second law, and we're going to take that in a very, fairly standard one-dimensional type of case, and that'll um, it'll give us a foundation on which to base all of the rest of the control and electrical uh, analysis, I guess, of the electric machines. And uh, we'll start again, like I said, Newton's second law. So why don't we jump right into it? So Newton's second law. Now, um, what do we have for Newton's second law? So Newton's second law tells us something. Uh, it tells us ME. Now, it usually doesn't tell us ME, but in our case, we're going to say ME. Uh, and this is equal to FT minus FR. Now, why don't we define everything so we could first of all figure out what this ME is. So this ME, we say ME, is defined as being equal to delta times M. Now, this delta is a mass factor. So we call this thing the mass factor. And this is due to the fact that uh, there may be multiple moments of inertia of all the various spinning and moving parts of the vehicle uh, that may contribute to the effective mass of the overall vehicle that's moving. And to account for that, uh, we use what's called the mass factor. And the mass factor is typically, let's say delta is typically between, I believe it's 1.01 .01 roughly, and 1.4. Right, so again, this is the effective mass, that's why it's called M sub E. And in the previous video, we defined this as being the tractive force. So this is the force exerted or uh, by the engine, I guess, or the, the motor, the force that propels the vehicle forward. And this is the road load. And so again, if you haven't seen that video, uh, I'll link that in the description below here so that you can uh, before you jump into this because a lot of these things may or may not make sense based on whether or not you've seen the previous one. So as mentioned, this equation here, uh, Newton's law, is going to be the foundation for the rest of our analysis. We don't go into a whole lot of detail with it, um, but what we can do are some pretty interesting or pretty useful things, and I don't know whether or not they're interesting is up to you, um, but we can do some fairly useful stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the acceleration time, because one of the things you always hear uh, is the acceleration time of a vehicle. It's like, oh, it went zero to 60 in this much time. It went from zero to 100 in this much time. And so um, this is the way we can determine that. So if we assume, let's say, a level road, so assume this is a level road. So you have a vehicle like this, and you uh, your vehicle is driving along on your level road, and your vehicle is basically a, uh, looks like a cannon, I guess. Uh, we'll put a window there because it should be a vehicle. Uh, uh, hopefully you can see out of your vehicle. If you can't, you're probably in trouble. So this is one-dimensional motion on a level road. So there's no uh, incline here. What we have then is we have, let's say, ME dV by dt is equal to FT. Now let's decompose the road load into the different parameters that we know to exist. So that's FR and then that's FD. Right? But we have equations for this. We don't have an equation for FT, uh, usually. Uh, so we leave it as a general tractive force, but we have an equation for FR. And if you recall, it's mg c0 plus c1 v squared. Now you might remember there being a cosine term here, but remember we also said that since alpha is usually small, and in this case alpha is zero, so that term cos alpha becomes one. Uh, so you can neglect, neglect, neglect that cos alpha in most cases. Uh, and then you have minus one half, one half rho a f c d uh, v squared. And you'll also notice I dropped the sine and I dropped the wind speed, uh, the sine function. I mean, not not the trigonometric function, but the sine function. That's whether it's positive or negative, because that's usually just to help you understand whether the force is. Uh, going against your vehicle or it's with your vehicle. Again, kind of the idea we looked at in the previous video of if it's going uphill uh, and it's downhill, the grade resistance sign usually changes. And this is a way to understand how that, uh, or th this th that, that sign function was a way to understand how that works. And in this case, we know that the drag is going to oppose the vehicle, so we can kind of simplify our equations in that way. So now what we can do is we can group things together and we can make a substitution here. So maybe we can add that substitution here as well. So that's dm dv 
by dt, let's say. Now if I group terms together, so let's group all the terms of v squared together, let's group all the constant terms together, and let's divide the whole thing by delta m, you would end up with an equation that says dv dt is equal to a first term, which is constant, so ft over delta m minus gco over delta minus gc1 over delta plus uh, rho a f c d over 2 delta m v squared. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make our life a little bit easier for reasons to become obvious later. We're going to call this k1 and we're going to call this k2. So that means k1 is defined as k1 is defined as f t over delta m minus g c0 over delta and k2 is defined as g c1, g c1, uh, that doesn't look like a very good g, sorry, that kind of, this kind of stuff really bothers me. For some reason now it's not erasing. Okay, so now it's erasing. Uh, g c1 over delta plus rho a f c d over 2 delta m. And then you can do is you can rewrite the entire expression that you had in terms of k1 and k2, but again, this is assuming constant. So if you have a constant ft, only then can you write this equation in this form. Otherwise, your equation would be would have a variable ft, so you can't assume the k1 is a constant, and then k1 would have to be a function of ft, and then this analysis is not as pretty as it might look in this video. So you have this is k1 minus k2 v squared, and now what you can do is you can obviously solve this because this is a simple uh, differential equation that you that you should be capable of solving uh, if you've taken any fundamental calculus courses. Um, so you can solve this how you can solve this by dividing out uh, k1 uh, or well dividing basically bringing the dt up and then bringing this down. So what does that look like? You have an integral from zero to v some speed dv uh, k1 minus k2 v squared. And this should be from 0 to t, uh, dt. I guess that's technically incorrect. And if there are some people that are math aficionados, they may, uh, they may leave some angry comments. So let's make them happy by saying this is d tau, so that the integration variable is not the same as the limit. And I guess we should do the same thing then on this side. And maybe we can call this uh, gamma. Uh, and then call this gamma as well. Because you can't integrate. Uh, over the same thing that is the limit. Although we like to do that a lot in engineering because we neglect the rules. So the solution to this equation uh, is uh, v of t, and this is an integral that you can solve using trigonometric substitution. I won't do that here because it's a tedious process and the solution is what we're really interested in. If you want, you can work through it, but you should be able to prove that it is the hyperbolic tangent uh, k1, k2, under the root, times t. Now this implies, uh, you can rearrange this, that's what I mean it implies, uh, that t is equal to 1 over k1, k2, under the root, uh, hyperbolic tangent, inverse this time, because you've, uh, you're basically isolating for the other variable, and that you just solved for in the previous part, and this would be v here. And so these are two expressions. So this is the speed, and this is the time. Now, something interesting you might notice here. If you, ima if you well, not imagine, if you just observe for a second what the plot of the hyperbolic tangent looks like, uh, if this is minus 1 and this is positive 1, then the plot actually does something that it goes up like this and it asymptotically approaches like that, and then it asymptotically approaches minus 1 here. So we can say this is plus 1, and this is minus 1. In this case, it would be k1, k2. So we can call this v of t, I guess. So why don't we call this v as a function of t, and this is t. So what that means is if you imagine for a second and you're a vehicle, you're not a vehicle, well, I, I, you might be a vehicle, I don't know. Uh, if, you're, if, if a vehicle is, is starting from this point 0, so let's just drop this down here. Uh, you would imagine that it would 
it would it, as the speed of the vehicle increases you'll no, you'll have noticed if you've ever driven a car that the longer you drive uh, you kind of hit some maximum speed at some point and it becomes difficult to drive past that um, now there are other things that are at work but one thing to understand is the way that your speed is modeled is you would have always at some point you will hit some maximum speed that your vehicle can't drive any faster than that so you would go up and you would approach asymptotically some speed um, over some time and the amount of time that it would take you to do that can be determined based on uh, this equation here actually but again, one thing you should understand is there is, an, there's a, there's an assumption that we made here. The assumption that we made here is, first of all, that uh, Ft is constant. And the second assumption we made is that it, this is level ground. So if either of these two things change, this analysis becomes a bit more involved and it's not this simple. But you can still use certain elements of this concept in your solution if that is the situation you have. Now what we can do is, we can go one step further, and we can say that if there is a constant ft, so if if, uh, if ft is constant, which is what we said it was before, um, the steady state uh, speed, we can say the steady state speed, how do we determine that? So the steady state speed uh, is essentially the limit when as this approaches infinity, right? So we can say that vf vf is going to equal the limit as t approaches infinity of of, of v of t basically uh, and v of t is k1 over k2 square root hyperbolic tangent of k1 k2 under the root uh, uh, times time and if you take this limit you'll find that this is equal to k1 over k2 under the root. So this is your steady state speed. Uh, so this is a useful thing to understand because it'll tell you uh, what your steady state speed would be given all these conditions. So again, remember K1 and K2 are, are properties of the forces, which are properties of the uh, the environment, of the speed of the vehicle, and all these kind of things. So you've accounted for all of that stuff in this in these constants and you end up with a fairly, what, what, what appears to be a fairly simple ratio um, for determining the steady state speed. So what did we do in this video? We looked at the equations of motion. We started off with Newton's second law, which everybody should know. Um, we expanded that to determine the acceleration time based on the forces that we are familiar with. And in, uh, in, in upcoming videos, what we'll do is we'll look at, first of all, we'll look at some examples of this kind of, of how these things are, are, are put into, or are, are used to solve actual uh, fairly practical problems. And then we'll build on uh, how these these uh, relationships can be used in order to determine the ratings of the motor, of the engine, what the vehicle should be able to supply, and all these kind of things. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And remember to like and support the channel if you, uh, sorry, yes, like, like the channel to support the channel. Subscribe to the channel to support the channel because it helps. And I hope these help. So we'll see you in the next one. Take care.